Hello, everybody. It's a real joy to be able to preach to you once again in church. I was getting too used to sitting on my sofa in my T-shirt and shorts. What a year it has been, hasn't it? In future, we will look back on 2020 and we'll just shake our heads. Well, today I'm going to speak to you on another value in our series on Kingdom Values, and that is Faithful Stewardship. Our text is Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 17. It, it's a familiar text to many of us, but also a difficult one. It is the parable of the shrewd manager. I have struggled with this passage for years, and I'm sure you would have also. So let me read it out to you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Luke chapter 16, from verse 1. He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their homes or houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were, were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. This is the word of God. Will you pray me, please? Almighty God, Heavenly Father, as we look to you and your word now, we ask you, Lord, to remove all distractions. Help us hear your still, soft voice and give us understanding. Amen. Now you can see why I struggled with this passage. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. There in verse 8. Make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, it says in verse 9. Is Jesus saying that we should use dishonest financial practices to get ourselves out of trouble? You know, recently I watched a Netflix documentary called Cartel Bank. 
It is part of a series of documentaries about dirty money. That's the name of the series, Dirty Money. And this cartel bank episode was entirely about HSBC, which, although it was originally named the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, is actually a British bank and the largest bank in Europe. I was quite intrigued because I bank there. That's my bank. And this cartel bank episode was all about how my bank, HSBC, failed to prevent Mexican and Colombian drug cartels from laundering nearly a billion US dollars through the bank. These were proceeds from the sale of illegal drugs. And the US federal investigators found evidence that senior bank officials were complicit in the illegal activity. They facilitated the money, uh, money laundering by drug cartels. And HSBC admitted it. In 2012, they apologized unreservedly for the historical weaknesses in our financial crime controls. But no HSBC executive ever faced charges for their actions. Instead, the bank paid a fine of US $1.9 billion in 2012 to avoid prosecution. I understand that is about a month's worth of profits. They used to make about 20 billion US a year in profits. So as I understand it then, the executives used the bank's money to pay the US Department of Justice $1.9 billion to enter into a deferred prosecution agreement so that no bank executive would be prosecuted. They retained their jobs, their salaries and bonuses. They kept their freedom. Ooh, I hope I get a sweet deal like that if I ever commit a major crime. Use other people's money not to get prosecuted. But that's outrageous, isn't it? And yet it appears to be what Jesus is advocating here. Or is he? I must have mentioned many times before that my favorite theologian is Bishop Nicholas Thomas Wright. It all began about 20 years ago when after Trinity Theological College, I went to Asbury Theological Seminary in Kentucky, USA. And there I had to take a class on New Testament theology. We had to read the entire first volume of N.T. Wright's magnum opus the New Testament and the people of God, all 500 pages of it. It blew my mind. I've been collecting books by N.T. Wright since. So there are many, many ways of looking at this passage, but today I'm once again depending on N.T. Wright's analysis of this passage. So let's look at this story again. This rich man wants to fire his steward or manager. And this dishonest manager then ingratiates himself with the rich man's debtors, changes the debt they owe, cooks the books, so to speak. And the rich man praised the manager for his shrewdness, for being clever. Why didn't the rich man just report his manager to the authorities, charge the manager in court? Because the rich man himself may very well have been engaged in illegal activity. You see, Jews were forbidden to lend money to each other for interest. The Old Testament laws specifically prohibited this. So in Exodus chapter 22, for example, verses 24 to 26, If you lend money to any of my people who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 36 onwards. Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. You shall not lend him your money at interest, nor give him your food for profit. The prophet Ezekiel goes further. He calls lending at interest an abomination worthy of death even if it is just your son who does it. So Ezekiel chapter 18, 
from verse 10, if he fathers a son who lends money at interest and takes profit, shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. Death for lending at interest, says the prophet Ezekiel. Serious business. But of course, there were ways to try to get around this prohibition. One way was to lend in kind, to lend people olive oil or wheat instead. How does this work? So let's say you come to me and you need some money. I then lend you 50 measures of oil instead. Here in verse 6, the word translated measure is the ancient unit batus or bath, which is about 32 litres. I lend you 50 baths of oil, which you can then go and sell the oil for money. But we agree that you will, at some specified point in time, give me back 100 measures of oil. And I would then go and convert that back to money. I would double my money. So I could charge you a lower rate for a larger loan. I might use a different measure. And in the Bible, the Greek word used in verse 7 is kurus, or cos, or wheat. It is also translated measure in English, but it is in fact a different unit. So I lend you 80 cores of wheat, but you give me back 100 cores, which is about 40,000 liters. There are other ways of evasion also, but this appears to be what the rich man was doing. The rich man was in fact charging interest. The manager obviously knew what was going on. And what the manager might have been doing was just reducing the bill to the original amount borrowed. He was deducting the interest from the bill the rich man was charging. So the rich man couldn't accuse the manager without exposing his own illegal deeds. He could only admire his manager's shrewdness. But the real question is, what is the story all about? As Christians, we tend to personalize Jesus' teachings. We like to think that every one of Jesus' stories speaks to us as individuals. But sometimes, the teachings refer to all of us as a people. Almost every first century Jewish story about a master and a steward is a story about God and Israel. God is the rich man or master here, and Israel is the manager or steward. Israel was supposed to be God's property manager, the light of the world, the sons or children of light in this story. But Israel is failing. Instead of drawing all people to God, they have excluded all non-Jews, the Gentiles. The Pharisees had tried to tighten up the law but that was just pushing people away. The temple in Jerusalem was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. But the Jews had put up a low barrier around the temple, and any Gentile crossing that barrier would be killed. Therefore, Israel was about to be dismissed. Its mandate handed over to a new people of God. And Jesus is saying then that Israel had failed to be a faithful steward. What Israel should do is to use money and land to make friends who could offer them lasting homes. Eternal dwellings here does not necessarily refer to heaven. It just means homes that last. This parable, as you can see, was very specifically speaking to the situation in Jesus' time. There was a brewing crisis. Within decades of Jesus' death, the Romans would destroy Israel as a nation. They would scatter the Jews in the world. Now was the time for them 
to make friends by any means, even unrighteous wealth, so that they would have alternate homes to go to when Israel was smashed. What is the lesson for us today? Well, the first thing Jesus is saying in today's passage is in verse 9, And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. Make friends for yourselves. How do we make friends for ourselves? By means of unrighteous wealth, so that when wealth fails, they may receive us into the eternal dwellings. The pastor and writer John Piper says that by unrighteous wealth, Jesus simply means wealth is part of the fallen and imperfect world in which we live. And Piper suggests that if we are going to look to when wealth fails, we should also think of when it does not fail. And in Luke chapter 12, verses 32 to 33, Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. So making friends with money today means using money to meet people's needs. That's how you lay up a treasure that does not fail. The manager was generous with the rich man's money. And we children of light need to be as shrewd as that manager. We need to be generous with our master's money to lay up a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Whose money is it? It is our master's money. And he wants us to be generous with it. Because our heavenly master has made us all managers of wealth. How do we use this wealth? Moving on from this parable, in the rest of the passage, Luke goes on to actual teaching about money. And there in verse 13 is a very explicit warning about the dangers of wealth. No servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. And the reason is in the preceding verses, verses 10 to 12. It's all about faithfulness. Money, wealth, land, status, talents, these are entrusted to us. God graciously gives his people gifts, but he expects us to use these for his glory, not for our glory or glamour. God wants us to be shrewd managers, but shrewdness in the new kingdom is what Luke 12, 33 says. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. So number one, make friends for yourselves. Meet the needs of others. Build a treasure that does not fail. Use wealth for God's glory not yours. Number two, Jesus is saying, be faithful in small things. In verse 10 and 11 today, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? Small things matter. Faithfulness to God matters, whether in small things or in large things. You don't have to wait till you are rich to be generous with what God has given you. I want to tell you that my home church is Kampong Kapo Methodist Church. And they have a large Tamil congregation there. When that ministry first started, most of them were lowly paid migrant laborers, but they gave generously. They gave generously of their time. 
Every public holiday, for example, the congregation held an overnight prayer meeting the night before because they didn't have to go to work the next day. Every public holiday. They gave generously of the money they earned. They had little, but they gave it for those even poorer. In the Asian financial crisis about 23 years ago, they started a Feed the Hungry program with the whole church. They provided free meals to those in need. The program continues today. The congregation also gave generously of their lives. Over the years, more than half a dozen members of that Tamil con congregation went back to India as missionaries. Having found Jesus in Singapore, they spent their lives for Him in the field in India. We don't have to be rich to be generous. We can be faithful with what we have already been given. Remember the story of the widow's might and Jesus honoured her giving. If we are not faithful with what we already have, we will not be entrusted with more. And who knows, what we have might even be taken away from us. There's a story that the late Pastor Dennis James Kennedy uh, told about a man who went to see Peter Marshall, the former chaplain of the US, the United States Senate. And the man had a concern about tithing. He said, I have a problem. I've been tithing for some time. It wasn't so bad when I was making 20,000 a year. You know, I could afford to give $2,000. But you see, now I'm making half a million a year. And there's just no way I can afford to give away 50,000 a year. So Dr. Marshall reflected on this wealthy, uh, wealthy man's dilemma. But he gave no advice. He simply said, yes, sir, I, I see that you do have a problem. I think we ought to pray about it. Is that all right? And the man agreed. So Dr. Marshall bowed his head. He prayed with boldness and authority. And this is what he prayed. Dear Lord, this man has a problem and I pray that you will help him. Lord, reduce his salary back to the place where he can afford to tithe. We have to be faithful in small things. Only then can we be faithful in all things. Today's passage is the challenge to be faithful. As N.T. Wright put it, faithful in our use of money, faithful to God rather than money, faithful in our hearts, not just in our outward appearances. Faithful to the kingdom which has now begun with Jesus. Faithful to our marriages. The alternative to God, really, is the other master, who is always ready to accept new servants. Who then will you serve? Come, let us pray. Father, we thank you for all that you have given us. You meet our daily needs and more. As you teach us to be truly grateful for all you give us, teach us to be faithful stewards and managers as well. Let us use all that you give us, not just for our own comfort and luxury and glamour, but for your glory, for your people. Help us, Lord, Build your kingdom with all that you have given us so that when you come, you may find us faithful. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.